Hello and welcome, everybody, to another special edition episode of Last Week in Quantum. This is the show where we review the week's news in the world of computing and its impact on the world of cybersecurity, AI, and more. I'm your host, Bill Roth, self-proclaimed Silicon Valley marketing genius. And today we have exclusive insight from a company that is actually building a quantum computer, Kuera. And with us to discuss this is Yuval Boger, the CMO of Kuera. Welcome, and tell us a little bit more about Kuera and what's going on there. Hey, Bill, good to be here. So Kuera is based in Boston. The uh, company is about four or five years old, uh, started out of... Uh, uh, some uh, genius labs at Harvard and MIT, and we make quantum computers. And indeed, we think we're on the path to making the world's best quantum computer. And the reason is that there are many different ways to make a quantum computer. Quantum computers use qubits, quantum bits, and there are many ways to build qubits. Some use superconducting chips, others use photons. We use neutral atoms, and we believe that neutral atoms are the best way to build quantum computers because we can build them in a scalable fashion because they don't require cryogenic cooling because we can put a lot of them in a small space. And out of the neutral atom vendors, we're the most advanced. We're actually the only company that has a publicly accessible quantum computer on Amazon Bracket since November of 22, so almost 15 months now. Amazing. Well, lots of lots of stuff to pick apart there. Uh, we've been taking a look at your work for a while. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we mentioned on the show that um, that you've the headline I think had something to do with the world's first fault tolerant quantum quantum computer, and that you're targeting a ten thousand qubit machine by twenty twenty six. Is that right? That is right. So in December of last year, uh, we published a paper. This was a work that was done at Harvard University, led by a Harvard team in collaboration with Quera and MIT and uh, National Institute of Standards and University of Maryland. And it showed for the first time a large scale algorithm that was conducted on what's called logical qubits. Logical qubits are a collection of physical qubits. Logical qubits um, help overcome the sensitivity and susceptibility of physical qubits to errors. And so for the first time, uh, the team demonstrated an algorithm with 48 logical qubits. The previous record was two or three, so uh, more than an order of magnitude more. And following that, we showcased a roadmap for computers in 2024, 25, and 26 with an increasing number of both physical qubits and logical qubits culminating in a 2026 machine that would have more than 10,000 physical qubits and about 100 logical qubits with error rates that are, of course, better than the logical qubits because that's the whole point of error correction. Mm -hmm. And with 100 logical qubits, you could do things that cannot be done on even the world's fastest and largest supercomputers. So mm -hmm. we're sort of heading pretty close to that point where quantum computers can deliver unbelievable value. Interesting. Well, I have a controversial opinion on this, and it stems from history. Just like when there was the outbreak of object databases back in the early 90s, sort of changing from relational, object databases really turned out to be just kind of a niche way of doing certain things. So I contend that quantum computing is essentially evolutionary. It's a way to take care of certain NP-hard problems uh, and it's it's not revolutionary. It's simply evolutionary. So where am I wrong? Well, let's look at um, AI. Let's look at ChatGPT, for instance. So mm -hmm. we sometimes say that it's an overnight sensation, 30 years in the making. All the AI algorithms, or many of them, were available for so many years. But what actually allowed the breakthrough was computational power. That computational power was the GPU, the graphic processing mm -hmm. unit, which, although it is used for graphics sometimes these days, it's mostly used these days for AI. Mm -hmm. So when the GPUs were invented, it was, oh, yeah, here's a nice architecture. And all of a sudden, you see that it enabled these amazing applications that could not be done reasonably with any classical CPU. 
So the same is true for quantum computers. The same is true for the QPU. Um, today, quantum computers are almost useless. They're in the sense that there's almost nothing that you can solve on a quantum computer that cannot be done classically. But we're getting closer and closer to that point where all of a sudden uh, algorithms that were just conceived of a few years ago could actually be executed in a way uh, beyond what you could do. So whether it's um, solving the climate crisis, whether it's a new drug discovery, whether it's optimizing your portfolio better, whether it's telling FedEx which package to deliver first based on changing traffic conditions or you know, breaking the world's financial system, I think that quantum computer is going to be much more than just evolutionary. Having said that, it's unlikely that we would use Zoom on a quantum computing or a computer or Microsoft board. So it would be just one more compute resource in a data center, just like a CPU, a GPU, and soon enough, a QPU. So in essence, it's sort of quantum architecture plus scale that in some ways is going to be the thing that is fundamentally changing the landscape. Does that sound about right? Yes, as we get more qubits, as we get better qubits, all of a sudden algorithms can uh, run in a very significant way. Excellent. So there was an article on uh, built in actually that you wrote uh, about open source and open source development in quantum computing. Uh, always fascinated and a huge fan of open source. Tell us, tell us how those two come together. The question that we were trying to answer in that uh, article is we've seen the huge impact that open source had on the enterprise software space. I mean, you look at Linux or MySQL or uh, some of the machine learning frameworks. And the question was, could there be something similar to accelerate quantum computing? And then we looked at both uh, open source software projects and open source hardware projects. Now on open source software, there's so much to be done. Uh, there's so much innovation coming <clears throat> from different corners of the earth, whether it's universities or hobbyists and companies on compilers or new algorithms or new optimization methods. So I'm very bullish about open source software as it relates to quantum computer. Open source hardware, not so much. Uh, it's not, you know, you, you can think about open source hardware projects like a Raspberry Pi or, or a Beagle board, and that's fun. And maybe they cost a couple hundred dollars to build together or less than that. Today, a quantum computer is millions and millions of dollars to build. So I'm a little bit more worried that there are not going to be that many people that can truly engage in open source hardware projects. Mm. But I think open source software for quantum computing has a tremendous benefit. And indeed, at Quera, we also um, manage and promote and publish several open source projects for those that want to use our computers. So with your roadmap to 10,000 qubits by 2026, how soon before we'll be able to basically uh, implement these encryption breaks and the hacking of the financial system? It sounds like it's getting closer and closer every day. It's getting closer and closer, but it's still several years away. I mean, you're referring, I think, to Shor's algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the financial encryption in the world is based on uh, factoring, basically taking two very, very large prime numbers. And, and if you could guess what these prime numbers are, uh, you'd be in good shape. Mm -hmm. But the quantum computers today can maybe factor 15 to three times five, but uh, not a whole lot more. So it'll, be, it'll take uh, several years until that happens. What is happening though, is that uh, rogue actors are probably recording a lot of the data, uh, what's called uh, store now, decrypt later. They're storing data in the hope that five, five years, 10 years from now, they might be able to do that. And I think one of the drives for this, na these national quantum programs is actually the desire to have something that your adversary does not have. So if I have a quantum computer and I can either hack your financial system, or if I can develop a vaccine faster than you, or if my uh, traffic network is gonna be more efficient, that that gives me a strategic advantage as a country, which I think is one reason that so many countries are investing billions in national quantum programs. 
and some of them are working with us to make that a reality. Interesting. So what fascinates me about the work that Cuera is doing is I think you're changing the game where today we think of quantum computers as some giant room that you have to basically get web access. But I think what Quera is doing is um, helping quantum computers to evolve to be on-prem in the data center. Is that right? Tell us more. So I think first there's, there's interestingly a lot of customer demand for on-premises quantum computers. And that comes from multiple sides. Uh, one, a lot of nations around the world are investing billions of dollars in national quantum programs. So the Finland or Korean or German quantum programs don't want a computer in Boston. They want a computer in Helsinki or Seoul mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or Hamburg. Uh, so they want to, to get that uh, quantum computer delivered. The second thing is about control. So if you're using shared cloud resources, you may be in the queue behind someone else that just submitted a really, really large job. So if when quantum computers become more mission critical, you want more control over priorities, who's using it, when are they using it, and so on. And third, there are organizations that worry about both data residency, where is the data, and data security. Am I comfortable sending my data to a quantum computer on the cloud as opposed to having it in my uh, data center. What Quera is doing, other than delivering these, and, and we just got awarded a, a very nice uh, contract to, to uh, uh, deliver a quantum computer to the UK, is we're making it easier to install it. So our quantum computer, because it uses neutral atom, does not require these dilution fridges. Uh, and so it just requires you know, pretty standard data center operating conditions. Power consumption is also uh, very low. Uh, our current generation computer consumes about seven kilowatts of power. That's about three hair dryers. So if you can run three hair dryers in your home, then you probably have enough electricity to power our quantum computer. Um, so based on all these reasons, both the customer demand and how we make it easier to install, uh, we see a lot of growth in on-premises quantum computers. Excellent. Well, that about wraps it up for today. You can find the links to all the articles mentioned today in the show notes. And if you want weekly quantum updates, of course, join our mailing list by visiting our LinkedIn page or by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, the Google Podcast, and coming soon, Apple. With us this week... Uh, for a special episode has been Yuval Boger, the CMO of Cuera. Thanks very much for attending, Yuval. Thanks for having me, Bill. That, folks, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Bill Roth, humble self-proclaimed Silicon Valley marketing genius. We've been talking with the folks at Cuera. That's Q-U-E-R-A.com for those of you paying attention. And we will see you next week on last week in quantum.